So let me thank you for your kind invitation for us to come and, uh, and speak to you today. It's, it's a privilege. And we're really happy to share with you some of the uh, things we've been through on this fairly lengthy journey to get to where we are. And uh, we still have a, a lot of distance to cover. What I'm going to talk about today is blood safety, um, where, how far we've come since the 1980s, what's, what's changed, and the weight of scientific evidence that's now adding to our ability to start changing some of these, pol uh, some of these policies. So hopefully I won't be too technical. If I am, just um, <coughs> yell at me, raise your hand, and I'll do my best to explain anything. So th these days, blood operators, uh, as always, have recipient safety as their foremost goal. And to ensure that that is in place, there are uh, three main pillars that support um, the maintenance of blood safety. The first being the donor who walks in the door. So uh, donors are selected specifically pri primarily through what we call a record of donation. So that's a very lengthy questionnaire that donors go through that asks them about things that may uh, put a recipient at risk, but also things that may put a donor at risk because we don't want to harm a donor who's kindly coming in and donating blood. Once we've collected a unit of blood from that donor, it then goes to donor testing. As you can see, we have a fairly long list of agents that we test for, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on that uh, later. That is obviously to protect the recipient, but also to provide information to the donor. So if a donor comes up positive for any of these, these tests, they are contacted, their physician is uh, pr provided the information if they so wish, and they can have the appropriate uh, follow-up with their physician. And then finally, uh, last but not least, we follow good manufacturing practices. Canadian Blood Services is regarded as a uh, biologics manufacturer and as such follows very similar practices to the pharmaceutical companies because we are producing a product which is going to be used uh, by recipients. So this is a, a picture. I expect you to be able to read this from the back, of course. Our donors can barely read it when they come in and have it in front of their face. So there are 85 five questions on this record of donation on the right hand side and it asks about uh, your health are you feeling well today first and foremost are you on any medications? Do you have any travel? So we look for travel to areas where malaria may be occurring, for example. Um, we ask about uh, behavioral practices, which may put folks at risk uh, for HIV, hepatitis B, for example. We ask uh, whether folks have lived for specific periods of time in the United Kingdom during the variant CJD outbreak, because that may put them at, at risk for variant CJD. So there's a whole list of things that we ask the donors, and this is every time they come in to donate. Um, once they've gone through that, they also are checked uh, for general health. They have their blood pressure checked, their pulse, and their temperature to make sure they're uh, in good health to donate. So aside from, from the MSM deferral, we have lots of other reasons for deferring donors, either temporarily or permanently from, do, from donating blood. For example, during West Nile season in the summer, we will uh, defer a donor for 56 days if they test positive through our testing or if they test positive through public health testing. Um, we have a 12-month deferral for travel to malaria endemic areas, so if you go off and uh, spend time in an area where there's malaria outbreaks, you have to wait a year before you can come and donate. Now, all of these uh, uh, infectious disease-related deferrals are linked to the uh, period of time when someone may have been infected and the time what we can detect that they are infected by testing. Um, so the incubation period or the, the window period. Obviously, we are also extremely conservative, and we defer people for far longer than an actual uh, in, uh, incubation period. But that is to uh, maintain safety and ensure that occasionally you do get people who have very, go through very long incubation periods, maybe, asymp maybe asymptomatic but infected, and we can't detect them for longer periods of time. So this is very conservative, and we recognize that. 
So as I mentioned before, we have other um, uh, indefinite deferrals in place uh, for donors who uh, may have been in contact with HIV or hepatitis for various reasons, and there are um, uh, numerous risks that are included in the record of donation um, on that. Uh, so most of our deferrals um, are in first-time donors. Our repeat donors obviously have already been through this process multiple times, and they've been tested, and the the uh, incidence of them becoming positive with a new infection is, is relatively low. The other indefinite deferral that we have is for uh, variant CJD. So this is, was a, a uniformly fatal uh, illness caused by prions, which occurred uh, in the UK in the early 1980s uh, into the early 1990s. So it, folks who've lived in the UK during that time period are uh, currently permanently deferred because of variant CJD risk even though that risk would be exceedingly small. And then we go on to donor testing. These days, donor testing is highly automated, very process controlled, um, and because of that, the testing is extremely accurate. These are the tests that we routinely do. Just wanted to show you as well the implementation dates for all of these uh, tests. So the first test that was actually implemented by the old Red Cross was the uh, syphilis antibody test back in 1949. Um, the next test to come along was hepatitis B surface antigen testing in 1972. And then in uh, 1985, HIV antibody testing was implemented. Uh, after that, in the late 90s and the early 2000s, there was a whole raft of additional testing added, in particular something we call nucleic acid testing or NAT testing. And I'll talk a little bit more about that because that has really revolutionized our ability to detect infections much earlier than we otherwise could with antibody testing. So as I mentioned before, CBS is a biologics manufacturer uh, and we follow GMP. So what does that mean? It means all of our processes are, are very well defined, validated and controlled to ensure that our products are consistent and of high quality. We follow uh, SOPs for every process. Um, most of our employees would tell you they are SOP'd to death. Um, but this is part of a requirement of a biologics manufacturer and Health Canada regularly audits us on whether our staff are following their, the SOPs as uh, they are written. We have extensive training programs for all of our staff to make sure they can carry out uh, the procedures and we document all procedures. We also have to have in place a system whereby if there is a problem with a product, we have a recall system and we also have a system where uh, people in the hospital can inform us of issues with products after they've been issued. So how, how good have we been at preventing infections uh, with all of this in place? We can tell that by looking at something we call residual risk. So the residual risk is what is the chance of a recipient getting an HIV or a hepatitis C infection, for example, from one of our products in spite of the fact that we highly select our donors, they all go through a very rigorous testing process, um, but there still is that window period, much shorter now than it used to be, um, but there still is a window period during which an infection could slip through and infect a recipient. So you will see here uh, the, the big three, HIV, hepatitis C, and hepatitis B. And these are the window periods as they currently exist with the current state of testing. So you can see that the window periods for uh, HIV and hepatitis C are now very short uh, compared to the old days. So approximately 10 days for HIV and about eight to nine days for hepatitis C. So it's a very short window period, but it still does exist. You'll see that for hepatitis B, the window period is quite a bit longer. We still haven't really narrowed the window period for hepatitis B as much as we would like, although I think with uh, the system we have in place now with screening donors for hepatitis B DNA up front, that will become shorter over time. Then if you look at the next column, this is the incident rate. So this is new infections which occur in repeat donors. So that's how we tell where risk is entering the blood donor population. So this is a donor who's tested negative all along. They've been donating maybe for years, and then suddenly they come up positive in one of our tests. So that's the incident rate. So we use the incident rate and the window period to calculate the residual risk. And if you look on the far column, this gives you the residual risk for all donors per million donations. So for HIV, the risk is one in eight million 
so it's ex extremely low. One in 6.7 million for hepatitis C, one in 1.7 million for hepatitis B. You have a higher chance of dying from a lightning strike than of getting infected by any of these agents in the current blood supply. And I just want to spend a, a minute talking about the test that's really revolutionized not only testing of blood donors but uh, diagnostic testing. This is something called polymerase chain reaction or as we call it in our business, uh, NAT testing or nucleic acid testing. So PCR, polymerase chain reaction, is really, think of it as a giant photocopier. So what you do is you have a specimen of patient's blood. It may contain one or two viruses, and that's very difficult to detect in standard testing. So you throw in all the things you need to make a strand of DNA or RNA, and you let that happen by raising and lowering temperature. And what that does is that it acts like a photocopier and makes millions and millions of copies of that RNA or DNA, which is then easy to detect. So this is a highly sensitive and highly specific method to allow us to detect infection very early so that we can even detect the fact that this virus is present before the person is symptomatic and before they have antibody. So this has really allowed us to shorten that window period dramatically. This was not possible in the early days of HIV. We just did not have PCR then. So Health Canada always brings back to us, well, we're fine with HIV and we're fine with hepatitis C and we're fine with hepatitis B, but what about risk of emerging infectious diseases? Well, if you look at what has emerged in the last number of years, none of these diseases are sexually transmitted. West Nile, which appeared in the early uh, two th late 90s, early 2000s, and is definitely transfusion transmitted, is a vector-borne, mosquito-borne infection. And everybody who, is, who lives in areas where, where where there are mosquitoes is at risk. Fortunately, on the West Coast, you're much less at risk than the rest of us. You have not had very many cases of West Nile. The other uh, infection that we are seeing more commonly in North America is something called Chagas disease. This is a, uh, a parasite that's transmitted by the bite of a reduvid bug, and it's endemic in uh, South America primarily. Why are we concerned about that? Well, with increasing immigration from these countries, we are seeing folks uh, who are coming into North America who are blood donors who are then passing this parasite on to recipients. So testing has been put in place uh, to look for Chagas disease, and it's much commoner in the U.S. than we have seen in, uh, in Canada because of different immigration policies. Babesiosis is another parasite. This is, another, this is a tick-borne disease. So you'll notice there's a common theme here with all these recently emerging diseases. They're all vector-borne diseases and they're not sexually transmitted diseases. Babesiosis is sort of similar to Lyme disease and occurs in the same area. And we're currently doing a large study on our donors at uh, CBS and Hema Quebec to see how common it is in our donor population. So far, we haven't found any. You'll be happy to know. The other big emerging infectious disease we've seen recently was uh, SARS in 2004. It hit Toronto uh, and Vancouver uh, in, a, in a very considerable way, particularly in our hospitals, but also had impact on us as blood suppliers because we were very concerned about uh, donors coming in who may have a SARS infection, not so much that they would pass it on to our uh, recipients, uh, because we weren't worried about people who may have virus in their blood because if they did they would be sick and in hospital but more concerned if they were in the early stages they might pass it on to other donors or to uh, to staff and more recently there's been a new uh, virus similar to SARS which has appeared in uh, primarily in Saudi Arabia very causes very severe infection but fortunately has caused relatively few infections but this is one that's being watched very closely so there's always something that we're watching on the infectious disease front but as you can see uh, the last two being primarily respiratory viruses spread in a similar way to influenza these have not been sexually transmitted diseases and so the risk in the, uh, in the gay population is virtually the same as the risk in the rest of the population. 
So I just want to show you a couple of slides on how things have changed since the 1980s and how we deal differently with emerging infectious diseases than we did back then. So HIV was a new infectious agent. We had never seen it before, and we knew, knew very little about it. We had no diagnostic tests available for it. West Nile, on the other hand, was a virus that was already uh, we'd seen in some parts of the world. It just had not been seen in North America. So there were always already tests around that we could adapt for, uh, for use. PCR did not exist in the 80s, so we didn't have this great way of detecting the presence of small amounts of virus in, uh, in, in people's blood. Um, with West Nile, it was the first test we, wa we went to when we wanted to uh, implement a test for West Nile. The time from identification of the disease, uh, of disease transmission through blood to the availability of the screening test. Well, for uh, HIV, as we know, uh, cases were seen first in, in hemophiliac patients in the early 80s. Um, it took until 1985, so three to four years before we had a test that uh, blood operators could implement for donor screening. With West Nile, there was a theoretical, we didn't even have a case of transfusion transmitted West Nile, but there was a theoretical risk that it could be, and it was identified in 2002. We had a test in place and were screening donors by 2003. The big things, though, that have really revolutionized the way we monitor infectious diseases and put measures in place to prevent them happening or prevent them spreading are the communications and surveillance that's now in place. In the early 80s, we didn't have the internet, certainly, and, and you relied on research papers appearing in scientific publications or word of mouth or attending meetings to find out about new diseases. These days, it happens real time on the internet. So if you belong to things like ProMed, Mail, as I do, this is an internet-based uh, service where physicians and people in, in uh, healthcare post things about outbreaks that are occurring in their country, so you hear immediately when something's happening and you can take action. We also did not have really good uh, collaboration between the blood operators, the public health, um, frontline physicians uh, back in the early 80s. And so we didn't have that dialogue that we have now where we have not only uh, cooperation uh, on a national level between the blood operators, public health folks, and the hospitals who are all uh, meeting together and talking about how we deal with these infections. And it really has made dealing with emerging infectious diseases is much more efficient. And in those days, we did not, stay, uh, not uh, seek stakeholder input, which we do, as you've heard from Don, uh, much more aggressively these days. And having that interaction both with our patient and our uh, donors and potential donor groups has really assisted us and, and also provided a good understanding, I think, both for us and for uh, various groups on how we deal with emerging infectious diseases. So we've had tremendous technological advances, not only in the uh, technology of testing, but also in the technology of communication since the early 1980s. And also, we now think of the world as a global health community, so that we know an outbreak that occurs in Saudi Arabia can easily uh, reach uh, Canada a um, uh, plane flight away. We also have developed uh, relationships with folks who work in animal health, because as you can see from some of the new emerging diseases I've showed you, some of them affect animals as well, and knowing what's going on in the animal population is often very important to inform uh, what we do with the human population. So that's the past and what's happening now. Did I make a joke and not realize it? <laughs> so what's coming next? So we've got all this testing in place, but really from a financial perspective, how long can we continue to, can, to add more tests to the system? So we really need a novel approach to deal with emerging infectious diseases and also with the agents that we already have. And so uh, pathogen and activation technologies are on the forefront of blood operators' minds right now. So these are methods of actually uh, putting something into a collected unit of blood which will uh, seek out bacteria, viruses, um, parasites, whatever happens to be there, and prevent them from replicating. And that's exactly what uh, pathogen and activation technologies do. And there are several uh, pathogen and activation technologies around, and they've actually been available in Europe for, for a number of years. So you can see by the green and blue boxes here where pathogen reduction is being used. Currently, this technology is not available for all blood products. It's available for 
for plasma and platelets. There's nothing that, that is yet um, useful in red blood cells, so we really need something we can use on the whole blood product, um, and in which case it will be make it a lot easier for everyone to implement. But many countries in Europe are already using, using this uh, strategy. Uh, in North America, as you can see, there is, nothing, there is no product currently licensed. So we are definitely behind Europe, uh, as we sometimes are, uh, with implementing new technology. And a lot of this is because our regulators, the FDA and Health Canada, are very conservative. And understandably so, given uh, what happened in the 1980s. However, I think in terms of where Health Canada is thinking on pathogen inactivation, they are certainly uh, open to looking at these products for licensure. So CBS is participating in a clinical trial of a product which is called Mirasol. Um, it's a large international clinical trial. And this is the product we're looking at. So Mirasol is the trade name for basically vitamin B2. So it's an agent that we like because it's a naturally occurring vitamin. Um, it has a very good safety profile and it works extremely well. So you add this product, currently it's available for platelets. Add it to a platelet product. Uh, it takes a few minutes uh, to act and then you can transfuse that pathogen inactivated platelet. Now the problem with pathogen inactivation is it's very, it's very good and it will kill a lot of organisms, but it will not kill them all. Unfortunately, it's not a magic bullet. There's still some viruses in particular that this technology will not kill. So we're still stuck uh, with having um, uh, viruses in particular that could enter the blood supply and not be managed by this process. However, I think this will be a big step forward for us. However, in looking at the implementation of this technology, it is very expensive. And we are looking at uh, an expensive technology in the face of uh, uh, financial restraints that we're all going through and a healthcare budget that has to be distributed not just to the blood suppliers, obviously, but to public health and to acute care hospitals. So, um, but I think over time we will be able to resolve a lot of these problems and hopefully, hopefully uh, be able to implement pathogen inactivation uh, in the next five to ten years probably, at least on some blood products. So that's it for me. Jennifer is now going to talk about um, the really excellent consultation process that uh, we went through with uh, our MSM policy.